Yo, what's up, Chehi? How are we doing this morning? How are we doing? Cool. Yo, welcome to your first chapel. Who's, who's, um, who is this? Well, how, how, that's hard to say. Who's first here at Chehi is this? Raise your hand if this is your first time here. Cool. Who's been here before? Oh, I love that. Give yourselves a round of applause for each other. I love that. Yo, my name is Caleb Treezeis, and I'm going to be your chapel speaker for this week. We're going to be honing in on the theme, whatever is true. Whatever is true. In this world of lies and many different agendas other than what Scripture has to say, it's important that we hone in on what is true, align our lives with it, and go for it. But before we jump in, every single chapel, we're going to start with a completely unrelated music pun, because why not? So if you know the answer, say it. What is Beethoven doing right now? He's decomposing. decomposing. Very good. Ah, he's decomposing. All right, cool. A couple of things about me. Um, I met my wife, Grace, at Cairn University here only um, two years ago. We graduated. We got married around that time as well. Um, we are expecting a baby girl in October. Super excited about that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm floored that I'm going to be a dad. Just you wait. Someday you're going to be a mom or dad. It's, it's like really strange to think about that. It's really fun. Super exciting. Um, I also work with middle school students for my job. For the past two years, I've been a chorus teacher at William Penn Middle School. We're right here at Cairn University. And I'm only 15 minutes away, right on the border of Jersey. Uh, I, I teach chorus there, teach general music. I direct the musical there this last year. Any, any musical gurus in the room? Anyone like crazy music? All right, who loves chorus? Who's a big chorus fan? I love it, yeah, that's cool. And okay, sorry instrumentalists, where are my instrumentalists? Thank you, all right, all right, cool, cool, thank you, thank you. I love instrumentalists, but, but chorus is better. All right, I also, in my spare time, I love to do a bunch of different things. I, I stay pretty busy. I love playing disc golf, I love playing soccer, just played some last night and I'm hurting today. <laughs> uh, play board games, I love those. I love to go biking and I really love to play piano. I'm one of those, those weird ones that just loves to practice all the time. I don't know what happened. At some point, I switched from, Mom, do I, I have to practice right now? I don't want to practice right now. And then, I, then some, at some point, I fell in love with it. Um, and that's me. Love piano. I've majored in music education and piano here um, and graduated only two years ago. So before we jump into what we're doing today, just want to give you a heads up. If you are willing to participate and pay attention during this, at this session and all the future sessions, you will get one of two options. One, candy from the Skippity Candy Jar. <clears throat> and two, a What the Sig Muffin <laughs> made by my wife, Grace. These are banana chocolate chip muffins. So What the Sig Muffins and uh, Skippity Candy. So just, just get ready, all right? Before we start, though, we have a story to tell you, and it involves one of your fellow campers. Ian, can you stand up? Cool. Everyone say, hi, Ian. Hi, Ian. All right, sit back down. Thank you, Ian. Snaps for Ian. Thank you. Cool. Nice job. That's, that's all I have for you today. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, the story. Here it is. Ian, <clears throat> later today, as he's going through um, crossing the road, that doesn't exist on Karen because there's never any traffic on Karen right now. Uh, he gets hit by a car, and Ian gets hospitalized and only a few hours later dies. I'm very sorry, Ian. Yep, I know. I just, I've, I've voluntold him at breakfast. He said, no, nah, don't worry about it. You don't have to do anything. I just killed you off. I'm very sorry. Um, but yeah, Ian dies later today, and you all find out about this, and it's, it's kind of awful because you just met the guy. Everyone said, hi, Ian. You know who he is. And... Now, Graham Bergen has to talk to you later tonight at sing time and explain what just happened. Yeah, one of your fellow campers just died. And we're never going to see him again. If you are having a tough time with that, especially if you're one of his closer friends, um, then you can go to counseling. we got counseling here. We have counselors. Yay. Here for, let's hear it for counselors. Yay. Um, but you, you have these resources, so sorry that this happened. We're going to try to move on as best we can. So all of our, everyone's kind of like starting off the week on a really bad note. Um, come tomorrow morning, you wake up, go to chapel, do all that kind of stuff. You go to class, 
Um, some of you might have a music theory class this week. You go there. There's only about 15, 20 of you in the class. And Ian walks in. What? Ian, you're supposed to be dead. Why are you walking into my class right now? As he walks in, everyone freaks out because they were told he was dead. They even, like, heard all about it. They prayed for his family. It was awful. But in, in walks Ian. As you can imagine, this sort of situation would freak everybody out. For the next 25 minutes, they didn't get any music theory work done. They just talked with Ian, and he explained how he came back from the dead. It was really strange. He actually had no idea, and he said, look, I, I had my lanyard around my neck, right? Everyone has their lanyard around their neck. I have my schedule with me, and when I came back from the dead, I was like, oh, it's time for music theory class, so I guess I should go there, and uh, then I went to music theory class, and then it showed up, and everyone's freaking out for some reason. Oh, right, I'm dead. I'm supposed to be dead, but he's feeling skippity today. He tells everybody, yup, I'm doing fine. I'm doing great, um, and 20 minutes later, at the end of class, you're all dismissed, Ian walks out of class. You go to chase him down to, like, like live with the, the resurrected Ian. Like, come on, man. I want, to, I want to be with you all the time. But you, you go to chase after him, and he's gone. He just disappears. You, you walk out the music building, he's gone. What? You talk with your other friends. They also can't find him anywhere. So strange. So you have an option. Do you tell other people that you saw Ian and be labeled as a total whack? Or... Or do you just keep quiet and not have to go to counseling? <laughs> I don't know. It's your option. Now, before we jump in today, you can kind of see where I'm going with this, right? So, so Jesus, when he rose from the dead, had way more evidence to plead his case than Ian did. Sorry, Ian. Sorry. But Ian only had 20 people that saw him, and um, Ian was only seen once. But, Ian, uh, but Jesus has so many more instances when he was seen, and um, how many people saw him, too. Way more than 20. So we'll jump into that later. All right, let's jump in. Let's see if this works. Week outline. Let's talk about what we're doing this whole week, and then we'll talk about what we're doing today. First off, we're going to be hitting again on that theme, whatever is true. Today, we're talking about Jesus' resurrection. Secondly, the Bible's legit, bro. That's tomorrow. We're going to talk about how true the Bible is. It's the other most ridiculous claim in all of Scripture. That is the Bible's written by God. That's like writing a book or writing an essay in English class and be like, yo, check it out. Handwritten by God. Pretty cool. No, you, you can't just claim something like that and people aren't just going to believe you. Don't take that claim for granted. We need to make sure we know what we're talking about as Christians. Implications. In light of these two big truths, we have major implications. First, how do we view ourselves in public? How do we view ourselves when we perform for others? Fourthly, how can we pursue the Lord in private? And fifthly, we're going to do that. We're going to practice pursuing the Lord in private. So that's Thursday, day four, private. Five, day five on Friday. We're actually going to do a bunch of um, pursuit of the Lord. It's going to be great. Before we get started, let's pray, all right? Close your eyes with me. Lord, would you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. I pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right, let's jump in. So here's our theme verse. What's, what's a chapel series without a theme verse? Can you, I know it's, it's kind of small up here, but can you try to read it with me? Let's do it together. Oh, oh, oh. All right, ready? Here we go. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, Pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. X quote, Paul the Apostle. Oh, yeah. In summary, think about what's true and put it into practice. So, today... Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Did he really rise from the dead? Nah, that's a big claim. You can't just say that about your friend Ian. Yeah, he just uh, came back from the dead and we're never going to see him again. Woo. How do you prove, prove any past event, though? Not just Jesus. Let's talk about how we could prove any past event. Make sure I'm in the right spot. 
So let's talk, let's talk about first breakfast this morning. Who went to breakfast this morning? Yeah, right. Y'all are filthy liars. Prove it to me. Did you eat corn? Oh, I hope not. All right. <clears throat> cool. All right. So let's start with some evidence. How would you prove that? <laughs> Sorry. I found that picture and I died laughing. I like just literally spent 10 minutes just looking at it. It's hilarious. All right. Evidence. First, you ask your eyewitnesses. <laughs> I got to keep it together. Okay. Hmm. Got this. Um, evidence. You'd ask your friends. Be like, yo, Ian had a friend at his table named Ian. So he could literally ask his other friend, Ian, say, yo, Ian, tell the other people here that are all thinking I'm lying. I was at breakfast, right? And Ian can say, well, yeah, Ian was at breakfast. And we'd all be like, okay, fine. He said that. Other, other things. Ian's got syrup all over his face because he ate too many pancakes. Waffle. Dude, why? I don't know why you did this, but you brought a waffle to chapel and put it in your pocket because you thought chapel was going to be boring. <laughs> That's a good one. All right, caffeine. Some of you drank too much coffee this morning and you'd be buzzed. You can show people that you were literally buzzed with caffeine. And, oh, we don't need to explain that one. <clears throat> All right, science versus legal historical. So we have two methods of proof. A really common one is like, oh, you got to prove it scientifically. Can we prove that Ian ate breakfast this morning at 7.30 a.m. using the scientific method. Well, let's talk about it. Scientif the scientific method must use two things. It must be observable and repeatable. Say that with me. Observable and repeatable. Great. Both of those have to be the case. Can we actually repeat 7.30 a.m. breakfast this morning? No. Nope. You're right. You're right on. Legal historical method. This is what we have to use instead. We have oral testimony. We ask Ian. Was Ian at breakfast, Ian? Yes, Ian was at breakfast. Written testimony. Well, nobody wrote it down, but we might have some cameras that would do the same job, right? They have a recorded proof that Ian walked into the Mac and ate breakfast and left the Mac. And finally, exhibits and artifacts. Well, we already talked about the food evidence side of things, right? Oh, oops, forgot we had that. So the resurrection. Let's stop talking about breakfast. Let's talk about some real substance here. Remind me again. Oh, who is that? Raise your hand. Oh, you get a Sig Muffin. Here you go. Oh, nice catch. Cool. Oh, and Ian, I forgot. Since I killed you off, you should probably get a Sig Muffin too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. So observable and repeatable. Can you all say that with me? Let's read the whole thing. The scientific method can only be used to prove something that is observable and repeatable. It must be doing that. But the legal historical method, raise your hand and explain. There are three pieces of evidence here. Three pieces of evidence. What's your name? But, um, the, the gray hoodie. Esther, what are the three pieces? You're there. I'll give you two. Who's got the third? Who's got the third? Yeah. Exhibits and artifacts. Here's your two. I'm going to chuck them at you. Good luck. Woo. You can pick them up later. Here you go. Ah, sorry. Bad throw. Pick it up later. Love it. Let's say them together. Can you read them with me? Oral testimony, written testimony, and exhibits and artifacts. Great. So let's talk about what specific evidence we have for the resurrection. Let's start with oral testimony. First off, how many people did we have in class with Ian? Do you remember? Can you raise your hand? Yep. In the back? Yeah. You're right. I'm sorry. To the left. 20. Yep. 20. We got it. Right? We have, we have 500 people, over 500 people that saw Jesus shortly after he died and then was raised from the dead. I'm getting ahead of my, my, myself here. Let me read you a verse here. Paul, in his, in his writings to the Corinthian church, he says the following. He says, first... Jesus appeared to Cephas. We all apparently need to know who Cephas is. The Corinthians did, so he didn't need to specify. Appeared to Cephas. Then to the twelve. Who is he referring to? The apostles. Yep, good. Then he appeared to more than 500 people at one time. At one time. They were all in the same room together. Must have been a big room. A lot bigger than this. And he saw all of them at the same time. Most of these people at the time were still alive. 
but some had fallen asleep or died, like Ian. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared to me, or Paul. All right? So that's a lot of people, 500 plus people. Another piece of evidence, the disciples' transformation. This one's big. If you know anything about the story of Jesus, we have the disciples, they're super hype about Jesus the Messiah. Jesus gets killed. For three days, they are devastated. Their best man is dead. They thought he was going to go take over the Romans and get, win back Israel for them. And he died. But three days later, yo, he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead, and they freaked out. We have Peter, the coward, moving from coward to zealot. We have Thomas, the doubter. He thought, he thought that Jesus was dead, even though other people told him oral testimony. Hey, I saw Jesus. He's risen from the dead. Thomas was like, nah, fat chance. And then he saw Jesus, and he freaked out and died for Jesus later in his life. He would not give up, and he did not let down. He knew that it was true. And then finally, the, probably the most convincing one is that Paul, oh, sorry, Paul, the apostle, formerly known as, do you know? Saul, yeah, formerly known as Saul, the most zealous Pharisee. And that guy hated Christians. He was killing them all over the place, persecuting them, ripping them out of houses and throwing them in jail. No, this guy did a complete 180 when he met Jesus. He saw Jesus in a vision, knew that it was real. Jesus totally flipped his life around, and he lived for Jesus for the rest of his life. You know, he wrote most of the New Testament, too. This guy's crazy. So that's oral testimony. Let's talk about written testimony. This one's pretty obvious, right? We got the New Testament. Four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all say the same thing. Jesus died and rose again. It would be a little less convincing if you got one dude who wrote a book and said, yeah, this really good friend of mine, Ian, died and rose again. But when four people write it down, they do a really good job, too, writing, all, writing down all the details. It's much more convincing. And lastly, exhibits and artifacts. Well, these places still exist. You have, in, for example, another, another worldview or another religion in Islam, Muhammad, when he got, when he got his career going, uh, he met Allah in this ambiguous place that we can't find today. He didn't no, like, we don't know where that is. We just know that it happened, according to um, Islam tradition. But Jesus, everything that he did in his entire life, and where he rose again and met people afterwards, all occurred in places that you can go see today. Has anyone ever been to Israel in here? I'm just curious. Oh, I love that. Yeah, so you would know what I'm talking about. You've been, I wish, I wish I've been to Israel, but never been. You should go. You should go see the exhibits and artifacts. These places exist, all right? See my how am I doing? How am I doing? All right, keep rolling. So, question for you then. I just gave you a fire hose. <laughs> Lots of information. Are you still objecting? Are you still thinking, yeah, I don't I don't buy this. It's just not it's still too big of a claim to say that someone died and rose again. Fair. I mean it's like it's a big claim. To say that, but the evidence would say otherwise. You're saying that your experience is your sole determining factor. If you don't, if you're not willing to believe that Jesus died and rose again, then you're dismissing all the evidence. You're saying, no, I needed to see him. I need to be one of the people to see him. Remember Thomas, the doubter? He said the same thing. I need to see Jesus to, to actually prove that Jesus rose from the dead. But, but Jesus had already risen. So Thomas was just denying the truth right in front of him. I hope you won't do the same. Thankfully, praise God, Jesus showed up in front of Thomas to prove, he was very gracious, he showed, showed up to Thomas to prove that he was alive. Um, he might, I doubt it, but he might do the same for us. It'd be really cool if he could show up right here and be like, yo, Jesus, I'm back. Right? But he's, he's not. We got all this other evidence, and that's all we need. Right? Another question. What more would it take you, or what would, what would it take to convince you or, or me that the resurrection is true? If you're still in unbelief, what more would it take? Do you really need more evidence? Do you really need, hold on, I'll get you right afterwards. Thank you so much for raising your hand. What more would it take? Would more evidence really do the trick? I doubt it. 
here's, here's my challenge for you this week. Oops, oops, oh, oh, gosh, I just gave away answers. <laughs> Whoops. Um, if this is a tough claim, and it is, and if you're still in denial, you're like, nah, this, isn't, this can't possibly be true. Wrestle with it this week. You got a lot of people here who are like-minded, who are also wrestling through the same question. And it would do you well to wrestle with this question. Because if Jesus, the Son of God, rose from the dead, gosh, it makes a world of difference. By the end of the week, make a decision about it. Did Jesus rise from the dead? If he did, I'm going to embrace that. And I'm going to live for him. So I guess I gave away the answer. What's the answer? Say it. Oh, dang it. The scientific method must be used to prove something. That is, say it again with me, observable and repeatable. All right, now I'm not going to give this one away. Raise your hand. Mm. Yes, what's your name? Right here. What's your name? What? Guinness. Guinness. Tell me, what three p pieces do we need? You're not sure? That's okay. I'll come back to you. Thanks for volunteering. Right behind you. Nicely done. That's tough. Let's say it with them. Ready? Oral, written testimony, exhibits, and artifacts. You need them all, right? Here's a Sig Muffin coming at you. Nice catch. Cool. Now, this one's tough. We didn't actually, I didn't quiz you on this one yet. Tell me a piece of evidence. Tell me a piece of evidence. Yes. Say again. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. See, I didn't even name this stuff. We got more pieces. Look. Oh, gosh, I'm so sorry. So watch. Watch this. We don't even have the time to, to cover all this evidence. We're going we're gonna to take two more. Yes. Right here. Yep. Um, the Bible. The Bible. You, too, you totally got the Bible. Thanks for answering. You got it. Yep. Let's talk about some specific things I said today. Yes. Right here. Blue lanyard. Oh, yes. You got a Sig Muffin. There you go. Coming at you. Whoa. Nice. Oh. All right. Cool. And lastly, let's try one more and we're out of here. Yes. What's your name? Mercy. The Apostles Transformation. Take a look. Hands down. Sorry. We got to get out of here. Take a look. 500 eyewitnesses. The transformation of the apostles and the written gospels. We've got it all. We have so much evidence. And just wait. When you come back tomorrow to hear about how legit the Bible is, you're going to find out there's even more. There's so much evidence to plead our case. We don't have to be stupid to be Christians. We don't have to deny like clear logic and reasoning. In fact, you can be a very intelligent person, exercise logic, and believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And it's, it's true. It's true. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you rose from the dead. Oh, I'm, in preparing for this, I was just floored over and over again that you actually did it. Thank you for rising from the dead to give us new life, and that we can believe in you. Would you guide us today? Would we live in light of that truth? And thank you so much for this group of campers. Would you bless their time here at Chehi? Would they grow not only in their love for music, but especially in their love for you? We pray all this in your name. Amen.